Good morning, everyone. Hi. Welcome to our panel this morning on what's new in litigation and legislation. My name is Jenny. I'm a 3L here at Lewis and Clark Law School, and I have the honor of introducing our two distinguished panelists this morning. We have Carter Dillard and Carney Ann Nasser, both from ALDF. And they've actually both elected to do their own introductions for you this morning. So we hear from them. Okay. I think I'm not first. I just can use this to scroll. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for getting up early with us. Um, I'm Carney Ann Nasser. I'm not going to bore you with a bio. You can go to the ALDF website if you really want to bore yourself with that. Um, I'm Legislative Counsel at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And uh, my background is in captive exotics. Um, and I have sort of made an executive decision that instead of talking about international legislative updates, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of the recent SeaWorld decision. So um, without further ado, get started. OK, so um, before, before we get, is Chris Green even here? Okay, so he's not here. But <laughs> before Chris Green departed um, as ALDS outgoing Director of Legislative Affairs, um, he, he, he did a couple of really awesome things. First of all, he worked for three years to ensure that the American Bar Association passed a resolution recommending that all state, local, federal, and territorial government bodies ban the ownership and use of captive exotic animals. So that is now an American, a full American Bar Association resolution, um, which is a phenomenal accomplishment by Chris. And that happened in February of 2015 at the ABA's annual meeting. So then fast forward a couple, a couple months later, and um, we have SeaWorld San Diego applying for a permit to expand the tanks um, at its San Diego Park. Uh, the project was called um, Project Blue World. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of technologically, just full disclosure, technologically challenged. I don't know how this happened where this is now, I have to like do a lot of things to get all these things to appear. It's like magic. But anyways, <laughs> this is the overview. Um, so we have this application submitted by SeaWorld with the hearing on, this is an overview of what we're going to talk about, the hearing that happened on October 8, um, 2015, where the California Coastal Commission did grant SeaWorld's application for the permit, but conditioned it upon um, the use of those expanded tanks only to house the 11 existing orcas already held captive there. Um, I know we're calling it a breeding ban, but just like a bullhook ban doesn't just ban bullhooks, the breeding ban um, doesn't just ban breeding. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, ALDF collaborated with a lot of other groups. This was a this was a team effort, though there were a lot of groups taking different, like seemingly opposing positions. It was all very well collaborated. Um, the, it was this is a, an incredible example of groups working together and coordinating together and accomplishing something tremendous, even when. Um, they're approaching it from a slightly different way. Um, a key player in all this was our consultant, Sarah Wan, who was the former chair of the California Coastal Commission. Um, this really, I mean, she, she was a tremendous, tremendous asset to this. I mean, she, this was a labor of love by Sarah, and um, she was just an incredible person to work with. And uh, she... She thought that this, we could get this done, and certainly she was right. Um, all right, and then we'll talk about what comes next in SeaWorld's challenge. Okay, I just want to kind of give you an idea of, of what we're dealing with. This is an aerial view of SeaWorld San Diego Park. Um, the tanks at issue here are the ones in the lower left-hand corner. Those are the tanks that, were, um, that Project Blue World sought to expand. This is another, this is just, I like to include this because it shows, like, it's an entertainment park. You know, they're talking about a lot of education, but we're, you know, looking at uh, amusement park rides and um, a lot of concessions, and it's just, it's, it's an amusement park. So, according to SeaWorld, this Blue World project would provide a dynamic, naturalistic, 
fantastic habitat for these animals that would allow them to dive up to uh, 50 feet. <laughs> Whereas, will you see in the another graphic, they dive hundreds of feet in the wild. Um, so there's a lot of spin here um, for this $100 million project that would um, enable SeaWorld to continue breeding, that would enable them to continue doing research for things that are only particular to animals who are kept in captivity. Um, this, is, this is the SeaWorld spin zone here. Um, <clears throat> So this is, a, this is sort of a, a diagram of the expansion that they have proposed. Um, the, the darker blue areas, so you, as you can see, the, the naturalistic aspect of the habitat only exists outside of the tank. It's really more about creating um, an, an experience and for the people who are paying to visit the park. Okay, so this, so this graphic shows um, how deep orcas dive in the wild. Um, this line traces how, how deep they dive in the wild. Um, the maximum recorded depth that we're aware of is over 800 feet. This tiny, tiny little blue box in the top in the middle shows how deep an orca can dive at SeaWorld. Um, that, that is, for SeaWorld Orlando, 35 feet. But the proposed expansion at SeaWorld San Diego would take it to 50 feet, which is still basically just a blip on the screen. Chris Green is now Hello. here after I've just sung his praises. Thanks for being late. <laughs> um, this, this diagram shows how far a, an orca in the wild has been documented to travel in about six hours. One of those circles, one of the little blips on this screen, shows how far an orca can travel at SeaWorld. So just to, to, get, to give a little bit of a perspective, off the coast of the San Juan Islands up near Washington. So we came together. Um, this was, like I said, a tremendous effort by a lot of different groups. Um, and this just shows, this is the coalition that Sara Wan, our, our, our consultant, put together. Um, and, you know, just to show what one person is capable of accomplishing. Um, we, we did a lot of work with her on the legal aspects. We did a lot of work on the, the legal strategy. But she, um, she really hit the pavement hard and was just an incredible person. <clears throat> so, what happened when, uh, after SeaWorld made its application to the California Coastal Commission for the permit to be able to expand. They sent a legal memo to the Coastal Commission basically saying that the Coastal Commission could not impose any sort of restrictions on the permit because of federal preemption. Um, I was looking for somebody to help me with some legal research and to do a, a memo specifically eviscerating SeaWorld's contention on the preemption issue. And Chris Berry, our absolutely incredible litigator at ALDF, um, said, well, I love preemption. So he became <laughs> our um, SeaWorld's uh, preemption guru um, and, and wrote an incredible memo tearing apart SeaWorld's legal claims. And they're claiming things like the, animal, the Federal Animal Welfare Act preempts the California Coastal Commission's jurisdiction to impose any commit any conditions on this permit. Well, if you're familiar with the Federal Animal Welfare Act, you know that it expressly states that it does not preempt and it in fact encourages state and local governments to implement their own more restrictive regulations. So this also this just goes into a little bit of what the California Coastal Commission's jurisdiction is and they have very very broad authority to oversee any activities that impact marine resources, and orcas are considered marine resources. Um, the applicable regulations provide that any permit that's issued shall be subject to reasonable terms and conditions in order to ensure that such development or action will be in, in accordance with the provisions of the Coastal Act. Um, they have broad authority, like I said, to regulate coastal and marine resources. 
and the California Coastal Act expressly requires that marine resources shall be maintained, enhanced, and where feasible, restored. And this is where the conditions come into play because it has been documented repeatedly that the use of and breeding of captive exotic animals actually has a detrimental impact. It not only does not help, it not only doesn't educate, it actually has a detrimental impact on wild populations, on their wild counterparts. Because what happens is people see these animals up close. They see them performing tricks. And it gives a false impression that these animals are not in peril in the wild. It, the money then that goes to people to see these animals have these up-close encounters that could be better spent on conservation of animals in the wild um, it is diverted in a way that's harmful to these populations and it makes us less concerned about their survival. <clears throat> so we spent months working with our coalition. I mean, this is an effort that would not have been possible without the Humane Society of the United States and their tremendous consultant, Jennifer Fearing. It would not have been possible without PETA. It would not have been possible without the Animal Welfare Institute and Naomi Rose, who is one of the preeminent experts on um, marine mammals and cetaceans. Um, this was uh, a really, really cool experience, like I said, um, to be working in concert and alongside while taking slightly different tactics. So we, you know, leading up to the vote, um, we had nine hours of testimony on, on uh, the 8th of October in Long Beach. Um, the, the commission had to reschedule, or not reschedule, but they had to change the location of the hearing because there were so many people planning on attending. SeaWorld paid its, its employees to attend the, the hearing. They put them on buses. They bused them in. Um, the you know, animal protection group sent out action alerts and collaborated to get, to just fill the room, and we had to have the hearing at the uh, Long Beach Convention Center, and even still we're overflowing. There are people watching a live stream on a screen outside, um, clear close to the parking lot at the convention center, because there were simply were not enough seats in the, in the room to uh, accommodate everybody. So after we hear nine hours of testimony, um, we finally get to the point where the commission is going to make a decision. And Commissioner Cox had made a motion to grant the permit without any conditions. Um, it was at this point when I, I think I was getting a little concerned. The people, the people in the room were getting a little bit concerned that despite all of the evidence, despite the very clear authority which uh, the Co Coastal Commission has, um, that... They, they might not go for what we had requested, which was granting the permit with the condition that the tanks only be used for the existing orcas. Um, Vice Chair Dana Bochco, who is an absolute rock star, she's an attorney, she gets it, she uh, understands um, their, their jurisdiction really well, and uh, why the condition that ended up being passed was so important. She made a motion to amend with conditions. Um, so she, before, before Cox's vote could go forward, she, she made a motion to amend. And that amendment passed 11-1. So Cox was the sole dissenting vote on adding the condition on no breeding and no additional workouts. Once that happened, I think we were all stunned. I think, you know, so we're sort of standing there thinking, I, I, so this condition just passed 11-1. Then what, the next hurdle was to have the whole commission vote on the permit with the, um, with the added condition of no breeding. And that result was unanimous. Um, we, the, I mean, it was silence. You know, you would have thought that with a room full of animal rights activists that there would be quite a stir um, but I think we were all so uh, just pleasantly and like overwhelmingly um, lost in the moment of that tremendous victory that it was pretty quiet um, when the vote happened. So SeaWorld had, we were supposed to not make any noise. Um, we're supposed to be pretty quiet in the 
in the room um, without a lot of clapping or anything. So uh, what happened was the varying groups had signs that would, that would wave when they heard something they liked or um, when speakers were speaking. And they, so SeaWorld had these Blue World Yes signs um, that say, on the, the flip side says, um, educate, inspire, and something else. But anyway, so as, <laughs> as, soon, as, as soon as the vote happened, um, they fled the building. They could not get out of there fast enough. They dumped their signs. So I took it upon myself to, to reappropriate one of their signs. <laughs> um, and uh, so it wasn't a no, actually. It was a yes, but with, with, the, with the conditions. Um, the, the specific condition, like I said, is that, because I, I think I've seen, um, when we talk about a breeding ban and that sort of, you know, the catchphrase that we're using, um, it doesn't quite, it's, it's sort of a, a quick way of explaining what the implications are. But the real language that's in this condition on the permit itself lists the 11 orcas by name. And it states that those tanks may not be used for any orcas other than those 11 orcas listed by name. So, you know, I've gotten a lot of follow-up questions um, regarding, well, what does this mean about, you know, insemination or transfers in from other parks, or what does it mean for, for potential wild capture? No, it's the 11 orcas listed by name, and that's, that's, that's the end of the story. Um, so, of course, SeaWorld has a response. It took them a, about a week to put one together, um, and I, I love this. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read it. Um, I, we, I did an interview on NPR, and, of course, SeaWorld will not do any live interviews. Um, they, what they do is they're sending, they're sending these taped statements, these pre-recorded statements, which actually, I mean, you would think that if somebody had the opportunity to do a recorded statement, that they would do it until it's pretty fluid, but it is absolutely bumbling, tripping over. I mean, I, this, I, I cleaned it up because otherwise it's just like, it, it's shocking that it's just like, like desperate to grab words and, and to try to find their footing in presenting their position. So this is according to a SeaWorld veterinarian. Breeding is a natural, fundamental right of animals. We know killer whales are social animals. It would be inhumane not to allow them to breed. Breeding is stimulating for the animals, which I think is an interesting Freudian slip, considering what, how they obtain the sperm for artificial insemination. The production of calves produces social bonds that are fundamental for the social structure of killer whales. Well, you know, all of this is, is incredible. I mean, I think back to, I think it was the TAFA conference in 2010, where Wayne Passell um, said that when your opposition has to start using the language of animal protection for its own messaging, then you know you're winning. Um, and this is, I mean, this is all animal protection language, right? We're talking about fundamental rights. We're talking about being inhumane. This is all the stuff that we, that, you know, the way that we present messaging, and now SeaWorld's having to um, try to try to include it in their own message. But it's laughable, right? I mean, in the last, while John Hargrove was a trainer at SeaWorld, there were um, at least 19 calves who were removed from their mothers. Um, the way that they go about breeding, it's not natural breeding. It is artificial insemination. It's inappropriate underage orcas who are forced to breed with older orcas. It's inbreeding with family members. Um, there's nothing natural about that. And the social bond, I mean, for them to be talking about social bonds, I mean, is completely a joke. So SeaWorld had a response, of course. Took about a week. Um, they announced their intent to challenge the California Coastal Commission condition. Um, they had this news release. It was on October 15th. And they... Uh, um, they, they act like they're pretty confident, but so we, like I said, Sara and I did, did an inter interview about the Coastal Commission jurisdiction, um, about the uh, authority to impose these conditions, about how the, any preemption arguments are completely misplaced and clearly refuted by the plain language of the statutes uh, that SeaWorld's claiming have preemption. Um, then Dana Bochco, um, the California Coastal Commission, did its own response. 
um, publicly. This was in the San Diego Union Tribune. And she does this absolutely eloquent, spot-on explanation of their jurisdiction. And she gives a lot of examples of other situations where um, the California Coastal Commission has had authority to act. She says, the commission has always been forward-thinking in its protection of the environment, and the Coastal Act is a broad law. Over the decades, it's been interpreted in ways that were controversial at the time, but have since become important foundations for coastal protection. For instance, courts have already upheld the commission's past actions to end racial and gender discrimination <laughs> in a private men's club to promote access, help, um, prohibit firework displays to disturb seabirds, and reverse the federal abandonment of a railroad. So ending the breeding program at SeaWorld San Diego, um, I think is, is my position is that it's clearly within the Coastal Commission's purview to take that action because it inarguably is a condition that impacts marine resources, which is what they are there to protect. <clears throat> well, just to give an international flavor, because I know I was supposed to talk about international stuff. So India um, has banned the use of cetaceans for performances. Um, and we have seen a lot of other countries, in fact, a lot of developing nations, ban the use of exotic animals for entertainment um, in circuses, traveling shows. Um, and this is having a ripple effect into the United States because we're seeing our sanctuary friends um, have to <clears throat> absorb some of the animals who are displaced by this. And there, you know, we have friends who are importing tigers and leopards and um, other animals who have uh, been used and abused in the circus industry. Okay, so, sorry, gratuitous self-promotion of the person I think who's the cutest <laughs> on the planet. But, so this is my son Jackson, and I, um, I, uh, he has seen a promotion of SeaWorld somewhere. Um, and he asked me what it was, and I gave him a very sort of neutral explanation of, of SeaWorld. And his response was, well, but mommy, whales don't belong in cages. So, I mean, out of the mouths of babes, right? Like, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, so if a five-year-old gets it, um, who, you know, I mean, thinks that Ninja Turtles are real, then I think that <laughs> we should all be able to get on board with that. Right, whoops. So, anyway, I think I'm over time, and I want to hand it off now. Obviously, there will be... Um, ALDF will continue to be involved in the uh, ongoing SeaWorld uh, efforts to uh, combat the, the excellent decision by the California Coastal Commission. Um, so that's now in the capable hands of our litigation team, Chris Berry and Carter Dillard. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Carter. Thanks, everyone. Uh, lots of young faces in the audience. I didn't get a chance to participate in the panel yesterday about how to get involved in animal law, but I'll start by throwing out my two cents, which is that your inclination might be to sort of go through institutional methods, right? Affiliate with some organization and try to climb up the ladder. Uh, I, I would recommend something totally opposite. I think that everyone, every young lawyer is capable of identifying a decent cause of action just by going through the news, uh, finding plaintiffs withstanding, and taking that case uh, from soup to nuts. And I think that's one way for young lawyers to get involved in animal law. That's how I got involved, uh, by litigating a case for an organization pro bono and sort of getting on their radar. So. My two cents for the panel yesterday morning at 8 a.m., I would, would add, if they didn't say it already, uh, that some of the cases we'll talk about today uh, are cases that any of you could bring and should bring, because this is a new field that's not completely institutionalized, uh, and you can take advantage of that opportunity uh, to make your own niche. So with that, that said, uh, we said so we give our own introductions. Um, I've been with ALDF for about five years, wonderful organization pretty fluid in terms of the cases that we're allowed to bring. 
uh, because we are so focused on legal outcomes. We don't have, we're not necessarily beholding to other campaigns the way larger organizations are and they have to limit what they can do in terms of their lawsuits. We've been very fluid and um, for that reason have been, um, it's been a joy to work there. Uh, and for any of you that want to at least get your uh, feet wet with animal law, please come up afterwards. Love to meet you and, and find out if there's a way for you to do at least do research with us um, and maybe work on some of our cases. Uh, I have no experience litigating in international forum, so I'm not sure I'm necessarily qualified uh, to tell you all about what's hot in international uh, litigation, other than that the amount of research that I've done the past couple days suggests that there's probably not what we could legitimately call international litigation for animals. We'll talk about something at the, at the WTO at the end that I think probably qualifies. But what I think what we're talking about is probably transnational litigation, right? Litigation in domestic venues that uh, involve issues between countries. Um, and we also see a lot of comparative law. So we see litigation in countries that use refer to uh, cases abroad um, and developing our own. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily international law. And to the extent that a lot of scholars pan uh, the concept of international law, even as it applies to things like core human rights, use Kogan's, things like that. I don't think it's surprising that we don't find a lot of development of hard, enforceable, traditional concept uh, law and international level for animals. This uh, edge of the uh, sort of universe idea about what we owe animals is probably not going to be first developed in an international forum. But I, so with that said, I think rather than giving a survey of what's going on in international litigation. I'm picking three avenues to think about international, transnational, comparative law uh, as litigators for how you can help animals. So how do you think about those areas of law um, as a U.S. domestic litigator if you want to help animals? Um, the first, and the, just the overview is simply I think we can think about it in terms of if you picked a case to file and litigate domestically here in the U.S. to achieve precedent, what could that precedent do to change other legal regimes, other countries' legal regimes for animals? Um, Steve Wise is not here, but my guess is his thinking about what appellate precedent in the United States uh, in terms of animal personhood is not something that's just going to be limited to the United States. If he gets precedent here, that's going to go elsewhere. So the first thing we'll talk about is how just setting precedent through domestic litigation can impact uh, international, transnational comparative law. Second uh, would be, let's say there are uh, fact patterns that go beyond domestic borders, they are uh, transnational fact patterns. How can we use litigation in domestic tribunals here in the U.S. to address those issues. And we'll talk about this with regard to Cecil the Lion, um, which, which uh, is a great example of what might be done. We still don't know how that's going to end. Um, and the third uh, example we'll talk about is, I think, more true international law, which is to the extent these issues get developed in international tribunals, and I think the WTO qualifies, um, how would a litigator uh, approach those issues um, and we'll move from recent findings about seal products in the EU legal regime uh, to what might eventually be challenges to limitations in US law, things like Prop 2 in California, other uh, limitations that may, may affect international trade um, but involve animal welfare. So the first one uh, why would we think that setting precedent in U.S. litigation might have impacts internationally? I think given U.S. lawyers' experience with the way our legal systems treat foreign precedent, which at least at the Supreme Court level is not very friendly, don't consider it very useful, uh, sort of this American exceptionalism, that trying to affect law abroad through cases we bring here seems 
like a stretch. But I, I would argue I think that that's not the case when it comes to changing fundamental norms. To the extent a particular country's legal regime is exceptional to itself, uh, maybe a precedent from abroad is not going to matter that much. But if we're talking about cases that indicate that there's some fundamental change among humans and how we relate to each other, the civil rights and apartheid, or how we relate to animals, that sort of fundamental change in norms and morals will migrate abroad. So civil rights and apartheid are great examples <coughs> of how international <coughs> development of standards um, had impact across the board. And I think the same can happen with animals. And that's why, to the extent there's going to be impact worldwide, some lawyers reaching for the stars when it comes to animal personhood uh, are most likely to succeed in changing international standards. And there are two cases that come to mind. Uh, Tommy in New York. Who knows about Tommy? Yeah. You're closest and you're the moderator, so you have to go first. Speak up loud. What's up with Tommy? So Tommy is a champion. Loud. Tommy is a chimpanzee in New York that they're seeking to gain legal personhood, but I think it was just to kill me, not succeed. Okay. Anyone know what the appellate term said? <coughs> Generally? Yeah. Well, I know they initially said that like there was standing, but then there was some sort of clarification a few days later that made it less. And that's, that's right. The Supreme Court, lowest court in New York, had made that determination, but the appellate term, anyone know what the appellate term said regarding why those animals didn't qualify for legal personhood under habeas theory? Yep. I, I think it was simply that although he was receptive to the idea, there was simply no basis in the law, and he, you know, not the Supreme Court. Right, so why, yeah, why is this comparing animals to persons, yeah. so the court has to look at... The English precedent. Right, look at precedent. What was the distinction? Yeah. I thought it was because of the duties yeah. that they don't have actual duties that they can perform or something to that extent. So. so there was talk, I mean, there's talk uh, about, one, there's one question about is there a distinction between humans and animals when it comes to this idea of habeas corpus and whether the whole point of the proceeding is to free the body and we can't do that with animals, but we could do that with other entities to which habeas have been applied in the past. But the real discussion sort of centers around this idea about can animals really have the same rights that humans have if they can't be obligated with legal duties in the same way, have those same legal obligations. And as a result, there's a distinction because we can legally obligate humans and punish them for failing to adhere to those obligations, but we can't, or maybe we shouldn't necessarily do that with animals, and that distinction is enough to not award habeas uh, and to say that animals are not entitled to that form of personhood. What's the problem with that argument? Well, if you have someone who's mentally handicapped, they're still a person, and they may not be able to fill a duty, but they still would apply. I mean, we wouldn't say that those persons aren't human, yeah. so the distinction might fall apart. Any counter? This idea that, yep, yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Well, I would say, Loud. theoretically, they at least have the ability to or had the ability to, were they not handicapped? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I think they're not handicapped because they don't have duties. And, and in fact, in, in this proceeding, there were guardians to represent the animals, and like the animals themselves had to go to court. The reason, I just, I'll circle back, the reason, what does this have to do with international law? If we're going to say that animals can be the right holders of legal, legal rights, whether or not they can be uh, held to a legal duty, that's a norm, a change that would apply to animals and human relationships across the board. It wouldn't necessarily be unique to US law. In fact, the habeas law is one that we inherit through common law from England um, and would apply in theory in common law jurisdictions elsewhere, right? Anywhere else in the, in the world in 2014, 2015, this issue popped up? 
Yeah, Argentina. What about it? Um, sorry. They, um, it was a similar situation. It's they, loud. Um, there was these monkeys, I think, or apes. I think in Brazil also. And I think the media said they won their case, but it was actually a little misleading. Am right, sure? orangutan named Sandra uh, in Argentina. Similar organization. Both of these are animal protection organizations bringing strategic impact litigation brings a habeas case on behalf of Sandra. It goes up on appeal to an appellate criminal court. Anyone know what the determination was? This is controversial. Why, why is the controversial what the holding was? That shouldn't be controversial. It was written in Spanish, <laughs> written in Spanish and there are, like, I mean, I think there are dueling interpretations uh, of what this means. But um, the reason there is some doubt about whether or not Sandra was recognized as a legal person has to do with that there are multiple forms of habeas corpus in Argentina, as there are in the U.S., and the, it's, it's possible that the appellate precedent that referred the case back down cited the wrong form of habeas um, when it did so. Now, that's not going to do anything to prevent the lower tribunal from eventually uh, relying on the proper form of habeas when it decides the case. So I don't think that that's actually a big deal, and there are apparently at least 18 other animals that are subject to these lower court proceedings. Um, so, uh, Jeff, you want to tell us more? But as I read it, unlike the decision by the appellate term in the third department in New York, the case, the appellate case in Argentina did establish, and I don't think it was necessarily dicta, uh, that Sandra was entitled to some protection under habeas uh, as an entity capable of holding legal rights. But Jeff, for anyone else that knows uh, and can translate the case better than I can, maybe you yeah, can. I mean, all, all I know is that there was a lot of initial enthusiasm. But that when, when people tested that enthusiasm and, and looked at the Spanish language a little more closely, there was some anxiety about what it really stood for. Yeah. Anyone else? If indeed it was simply a matter of the appellate decision citing the wrong provision, but in the end holding that the animal Sandra was capable of holding a right to freedom under habeas statute, I don't think that's a really, I don't think that's going to be a major problem. Um, it's only dicta in the sense that the court made a technical error that it could, it could correct. So that, I think, those two cases are good examples of changing an underlying norm, how we relate to animals, and who is a legal right holder, can be a legal right holder. That's the sort of precedent that can migrate abroad and quickly develop. Um, and that's the sort of precedent that I think, uh, while ALDF pursues much more conservative methods, uh, that's the sort of precedent that I think uh, young lawyers could be looking to develop um, that said, there are other ways, we sort of close this part out, there are other ways to develop animal personhood. Um, maybe animal personhood isn't so much about a court saying that an animal and a human both deserve the same legal protection in a given circumstance, as in going to find that an animal is subject to habeas corpus. Maybe it's simply that we're taking individual rights that humans have, like a bundle of rights or sticks, and we're moving them bit by bit over to animals. One uh, might be that currently, generally, the state or prosecutors have exclusive authority to bring criminal proceedings in cases of animal cruelty. Um, but in some cases, if we want to prevent animal cruelty, it's not about uh, penalty, prosecution, and criminality. Maybe it's simply about being able to enjoin, civilly enjoin, acts of cruelty. So we use underlying cruelty law, and we can bring a civil injunction, in some cases, to prevent that. That doesn't implicate the criminal tribunals at all, and in fact, it gets at the underlying problem of preventing animal cruelty, and all we've done is simply given the animal uh, a right to be represented in a civil injunction by a person, maybe somebody who, with, with specific qualifications to avoid the floodgate problem, like put up a bond 
um, like be, perhaps become an SPCA or some other qualification. That is another way, I think, in the, the way LDF currently is pursuing animal personhood. And that's a form, Scott Heiser's here, his team responsible for developing that form, I think, of animal personhood in Oregon most recently um, through amendment of the nuisance law and prevention of cruelty is one of many crimes one could try to enjoin as a nuisance. That is an area, I think, of developing personhood. So second, quickly now, the second area um, that we might get involved in would be litigating domestically on behalf of animals as, it, as the activity occurs across state lines. Cecil the lion uh, is a great example of that. Crime ostensibly committed, uh, broad, still being investigated. What would be the domestic hook here for a lawyer interested in dealing with, with what happened with Cecil? Anyone know? Carney Ann knows. So would there been could there have been any violations of US domestic law? Yeah. Is that Lacey? Lacey Act. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean this is still under investigation, but another another way to handle this is to think about what domestic laws might be violated by acts abroad. And in this case, uh, if in fact the shooter knew if there was some some level of of uh, knowledge regarding the illegal take of Cecil based on foreign law and some um, additional importation, arguably that had to be an additional requirement, I'm not sure that's clear. That's another basis for it. So Fish and Wildlife Service is indeed investigating um, the shooter for potential violations of domestic law here. Um, no civil cause of action, no right for lawyers here to necessarily get involved, but what could you do as an animal advocate? You'd support the investigation and if in fact there's a crime prosecution uh, based on domestic law here. What other examples are there uh, for using domestic law regarding things occurring in international sphere, right? The take of beluga whales uh, in Russia by a US aquarium in Georgia would that violate Marine Mammal Protection Act obligations? NIMS, it was held, was correct in denying that permit. That, that denial was upheld by a U.S. court, right? That only happens in some ways because the agencies are well aware that U.S. activist lawyers like you all will get involved um, in these matters. So this is a, an example. Other examples you, using U.S. law? Navy sonar tests in the Pacific. Um, determined to violate NIMS had not done its due diligence with regard to MMPA and ESA obligations. So uh, without thinking about these things as sort of complex international law matters, things that U.S. entities, and it's good to have your defendant here in the U.S., what they do abroad can always be assessed under U.S. domestic law. Uh, Cecil, the beluga whales, Navy test, these are all great examples of how you can still in affect international outcomes through domestic legislation. And I'll end with, the, with what I think is the third and final, the true international law standard. And that's the question um, about countries' obligations to one another with regard to trade and how limitations domestically uh, on trade um, can run afoul of countries' obligations under GATT. So the EU's regime on the importation of seal products limited importation, largely because of HSI and other groups uh, publicizing the takes of these animals in Canada and elsewhere. Question is, is the limitation on those importations um, limitation on trade? No. Uh, the WTO finds that it fits squarely within, despite some exceptions that were knocked out, the underlying prohibition fit within the public morals exception uh, under GATT that allows countries to limit trade where there are valid public morals at issue. And this uh, regime was a clear example of valid public morals. Um, so those sorts of, these sorts of cases might come up again and soon um, with regard to increasing limitations based on US domestic law 
uh, things like Prop 2, limitations on production method, on sales, uh, all based in theory now after the WTO's findings um, on a public morals exception. So with those, those three areas, I'll sort of wrap it up by saying um, my sense is that between establishing precedent domestically, uh, that would change a basic norm, like whether animals could be right holders under habeas, or whether you're bringing litigation against domestic entities because of what they do abroad, whether it's governmental, <coughs> private entities, um, even individual hunters, um, in the case of Sess of the Lion, or lastly, whether it's getting involved in true international law development. And in this case, could be uh, through submitting advice to tribunals like the WTO through a mechanism that was like habeas, uh, probably the only thing that, that uh, U.S. activist lawyers could have done at that point. Um, these are all areas where what each of you can really influence standards that are proliferating abroad. Um, and in a, in a world that's increasingly globalized and where our enemies can hide uh, through that globalization, using these methods to target uh, the, our opponents, for lack of a better word, um, will probably become an increasing part of every animal laws lawyer's arsenal. So thank you all for listening. So we have about 10 minutes for questions, if you'd like to direct them toward you. Okay. Yeah, this popped into my head as you're talking about this. So SeaWorld's saying, one of the things they're saying is that there's a difference between the captive and the free, that they, they may acknowledge that, that the Coast Commission has a, a ability to regulate wild cetacean and wild orcas, but yet captive orcas fall out. Is there any way, you, I guess you're Chris Berry, is there any way to analogize to the uh, Fish and Wildlife Services decision last year to extend ESA protections to captive chimps as well as wild chimps? Well, I think, I mean, they, the Endangered Species Act protects um, captive animals. You know, that, that, that split listing with chimps was unique because other endangered species who are listed are not split listed. So, um, so yeah, no, that's cap a captive tiger is a wild tiger. You can't a take of a wild tiger, a take of a captive tiger. It's treated the same under the Endangered Species Act. I think with the Coastal Act, um, captive orcas and wild orcas, they're not treated any differently. There is no differentiation. Um, so there's no basis for an argument that these captive orcas should be accorded with less consideration uh, or somehow not considered a marine resource. Um, it just, I think that that um, holds no water, so to speak. <laughs> Has there been any uh, litigation regarding um, our interest on the behalf of the ALDF to address the value of animals? For example, uh, and I'm from Iowa, yeah. and we have, there's a reason that we're 49th out of the 50 for the animal protection, but we have just market value. Yeah. And there's been, I've tried to bring some things with loss of companionship and um, maybe aesthetic value or something that could give a jury uh, something to punish someone with other than a few hundred bucks for a, a 10 year old dog that was. Uh, You're sitting two people away from the expert on animal valuation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I don't know if Carl Go ahead, yeah. Really no, well, Chris is the expert on vet mal at least, um, so you can talk about that and I'll add something. Yeah, it just, for a while I think there was a small window, and actually the, the problem is that, yeah, it makes total sense across the board, but um, the veterinary industry was the ones coming in and fighting it, and we actually made some inroads, uh, some of them started to get it, this was a moving train, and the sooner they got on board, so for example in California, the uh, California Veterinary Medical Association put together a task force that was on, unanimously uh, uh, agreed to introduce legislation allowing that needs to be sued for up to $25,000, which everyone kind of thought was around the magic number that we give both sides to agree to. Um, which, is, I mean, I was, my jaw was on the ground after working on this for eight years or whatever at the time. Like the veterinarians themselves are introducing legislation that allow themselves to be sued for 25 grand. Uh, 
But the problem is, and, and, and so the pharmaceutical industry makes billions of dollars off of uh, companion animal pharmaceuticals, and they came in and just you know, scared the overall board, uh, the CVMA, and shut it, shut it down. So a month later, when the deadline passed uh, for introducing legislation in that session, uh, there was a Bluestone case, which was a $39,000 judgment with that malpractice case in California. And uh, then all of a sudden, like, that's your window, guys. I can no longer go back to the animal advocates and get them to agree to $25,000 when they know they can get thirty nine in the courts. So the vets see this as a, a moving target as soon as they get on board and kind of set a number. But the pharmaceutical industry, it's a group called the Animal Health Institute, uh, and they employ folks from Shook Hardy, which is a uh, D.C. lobbying firm that represents asbestos manufacturers, tobacco manufacturers, or they're the good guys. Yeah. Uh, and they, they're just over there dividing. They come in and lie. So there was a big case in, um, sorry, Mom, there's a big case in the Texas Supreme Court on this Can very issue. What's that? Can you speak up? I can't hear you. Uh, I'm kind of sick. Uh, there's a big, there was a, this came before the Texas Supreme Court, uh, Randy Turner, and he actually quoted my article, my research on this, because the Chief Justice said, well, what's this I hear about skyrocketing vet malpractice claim uh, insurance? And, uh, um, and Victor Schwartz, the representative of HA, got up and basically lied in court. He's like, well, that was all just based on the telephone call to get to the bottom of it. And knowing full well, because he quotes my, you know. Uh, and so I sent out, thank everybody, like, hey, you just lied in the court. You know you did. So it, it, they're just, they're just not over there, right? They're going to lie, they can spend money, they can do whatever. It's, it's a really tough one, because every single civil practitioner I know said the number one cause for phone calls, you know, the cold calls they get out of the blue, are <coughs> companion animal, you know, vet malpractice companion animal death cases. So it's a, I don't know what to tell you. It's really tough. Yeah, and I mean, just from a strategic impact litigation perspective, it would be great to value animals market-wise more because you create disincentives on harming them right. uh, because those costs will be put back on you. But there's also a theoretical problem with making animals value contingent on what we would pay or not pay for them. Those, they have intrinsic value irrespective of their market value. So there's, uh, I guess my point is I think animal law litigators ought to do those cases to get the value up, but I wouldn't spend my whole time doing it. Well, um, so I think that this decision, so, you know, ALDF working with, with Sara Wan as our, as our consultant and lobbyist who told us that this, the Coastal Commission would not, and sorry for a little bit of backstory, but the Coastal Commission would not go for a, 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 a no. They wouldn't go for a flat denial of the permit request. Um, there was not sufficient uh, basis in her mind for them to just flatly deny it. Um, and it was, it was her thinking that they would go for a permit that would place the conditions that there not be any additional orcas added to those tanks and a de facto phase out of the orca program at SeaWorld San Diego. Um, so that though was tied to a specific permit request. So that is how this has all come about. Um, I think that the way that this will impact Orlando and San Antonio is that SeaWorld is on the ropes, right? They're back on their heels having to figure out what they have to do because of what they've told and represented to their shareholders, what they have to do um, PR-wise, which they, they never seem to be able to figure out what the best thing is in that regard. Um, I, I think that this is just, this will be another nail in the coffin. You know, their, their stock prices immediately went down even further. Um, and I think that, you know, what, what we, um, what would be probably the best thing for them to do from a, from a PR standpoint um, would be to join Ringling Brothers and say, you know what, we're a multi-billion dollar entertainment corporation and the public sentiments are changing. The, you know, the data is there to show that the public is not um, embracing the use of complex animals in entertainment acts. So we're turning away from that. And so I think that the, if they were going to get out in front of this thing, the choice would be for them to do something like that, to phase out, to voluntarily do it. But does this, does this the only way that this would impact 
Orlando and San Antonio directly would be, they wouldn't be able to bring in any orcas from those facilities. So the breeding ban in San Diego would um, not, doesn't mean that that breeding can then happen elsewhere and then be, you know, those orcas can be added. It's very specific to the 11 there. So, you know, I think that it just affects San Diego. I mean, it affects SeaWorld on a broader, as, a, as an entertainment corporation. So it will impact Orlando and San Antonio because they are part of that corporation and they're going to have to make some decisions on the, the, a nationwide scale about where their business goes from here because really the only, they're, they're demonstrating uh, by their decision, to, you know, their announcement that they're, they're going to challenge these permit conditions in court, it really shows that expanding those tanks was never about improving the lives of the orcas to begin with. It it's, it comes all comes back to their want and need to continue breeding their money makers. And they did something very cagey at the uh, at the hearing where they said, "Well, we'll offer to only ever have 15 orcas there." But that's not a phase out. That's a continued propagation of the population. Um, and keeping, you know, adding to that population and make sh making sure that they continue to have this large population of um, warehouse orcas, if you will. So that was, fortunately, that suggestion fell on deaf ears of 11 out of the 12 commissioners who were making the decision. But, um, you know, I think that in terms of you can, you can continue to watch what, you know, Chris is, legal efforts are going to be once this case gets rolling because um, there are a variety of different things that, that we'll be doing um, once SeaWorld undertakes that <coughs> legal challenge. Um, so, but I think that it's important for the public to continue to protest. It's important to continue to um, show that there's the public sentiment is against the use of these animals and that will, you know, these are all um, different facets of the same effort that we're all in this together and all of these different pieces whether it's the public demonstrations whether it's the legal wrangling behind the scenes um, I think that it, you know it all plays an important role in hopefully what will be a corporate decision to listen to their constituency and you know get these orcas out of the tanks and out of entertainment and I'll just add that there are state law obligations in Florida that SeaWorld's traipsing near, and their representations to the public and to their shareholders are misleading. They've already been the subject of class action regarding that. So I think if you were looking to join the fight, those are two areas. ALDF is focused on Melita because we think the situation is uniquely bad, but um, SeaWorld's not far behind. So I think we can take one more question, but I'm sure that both of our panelists will be happy to speak to everyone afterwards. Uh, well, just as an FYI, uh, <coughs> SeaWorld had a lot of commercial in Boston, which surprises me. Boston is quite a long distance from anybody who's going to SeaWorld. But it, it strikes me that they, presumably they've got dolphin shows as well. Sure. Yeah, sea lions, yeah, sharks. You really, you don't want Not the sharks aren't doing tricks, in, but they're all in hockey <laughs> animals, basically. Yeah. Uh, and and so it, it seems to me that kind of the ultimate objective here is to shut down all sea worlds. Uh, well, no, no. I, I want to make that clear that that's not um, the the goal is not to shut down.